This is a special edition of the Morning Star Report, November 6, 2017. A momentous day after a momentous week. This is Robert Morningstar, I'm your host, and I have a very special guest with us today. He is the author of a book called Watergate Exposed. He was uh, involved in the operations uh, surrounding the events of the Watergate crisis, as I would call it, during the Nixon administration. And he has a most interesting and uh, remarkable story to share. My guest is Mr. Robert Merritt. He was my guest yesterday on Cognitive Resonance. And I felt that his message is uh, so important that we had to do this program to really give, uh, give it time to do justice to his story. And that's what we are seeking in this case. Uh, certain degree of justice after so many years. So, Mr. Robert Merritt, welcome to the Morning Star Report. Thank you for being thank, here. Thank you, Mr. Morning Star, and uh, thank the people in your audience for taking the time to listen to me. Well, I would like to begin with uh, perhaps your early life. Uh, tell us uh, about that. Um, I know your background and uh, so from yesterday's program, and so I would say just uh, as a quick background to get into the uh, more important details of, of your uh, account, is that you were born and raised in West Virginia and are a person with, as I like to call it, 2020 vision and 2020 tongue, and you grew up there and then uh, became involved in a uh, police affairs. So if you would take us through your story at, at your pace and uh, focusing on what you consider the most important, let's uh, tell the people what Watergate Exposed is really all about. Sure. I'll uh, start with just my early childhood and give you a brief synopsis on that. And that was, uh, I was raised by my grandparents in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, a little town outside of Charleston called Rand, R-A-N-D. I grew uh, up in the, in the mountains of uh, West Virginia. The, the uh, average day that I thought for young people was to go fishing, to hunting, to sports, outdoor sports, of course, mountain climbing, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I had a rather bizarre type of uh, family home. Like I said, I was raised by my grandparents because my mother and so-called father uh, had ended up getting remarried and divorced on 16 different times. I think they set a world record. But uh, my father was, uh, he actually was not my father, but anyways, he was very brutal to my mother. Uh, he was uh, a wife beater, a child, uh, a child beater, that that type of individual, but um, anyways, finally, uh, my, well, my mother got involved in in returning to uh, to alcohol, not drugs, but alcohol, and as a result of that, uh, coming from a ch small town in West Virginia was something that everybody knew everybody, and uh, there was literally no secrets. I mean, the time. You would go to bed at night and wake up the next morning. Everybody in the whole town knew who had who had been to bed with who. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, my mother, being an alcoholic, she was tarnishing the reputation of my grandparents, who were very devout Christian religious people. And uh, but again, with a, another strange strange background, my family migrated there like over 200 years ago from. From that time, 100, about 150 years ago, I'm sorry, and uh, I migrated from a town in Virginia called Covington, Virginia. Covington was named after my great grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, I was being uh, taunted and abused, you might say, by family members and also by people in the community about my mother's alcoholism and. Uh, I, I couldn't take it anymore because I, I was going to a public school. I asked my grandparents, I told them, I said, either 
either be allowed to go to a Catholic school, which nobody in our home was Catholic. In fact, my family was rather anti-Catholic. But I had to get to a private school where I wouldn't be subjected to this type of taunting anymore from people in the community. And I had to travel like about seven miles on the bus to, to go into town. So, so nobody knew me. I was able to start off anew. How old but, were you at uh, this time? One, How old were you at this age? I was about 13. Okay. Just, uh, uh, and may I ask what year that might have been or would have been when you were 13? 1950. Seven, maybe. Okay. I was born in born in 1944. So. Okay. Um, but anyway, I started going to the Catholic school. It was called Sacred Heart, and we were taught by the nuns who wore the habits of Sacred Heart nuns. The priest across the street from the school was the Franciscan uh, uh, friars or monks or priests. They were the order of the Capuchin, the Capuchin order, the Franciscan order. And, uh, of course, they, their attire was to wear the little brown robes with the rope center with three knots in the sandals and the hooded um, the hooded robe. Um, one of the things about not having to go there, other than the fact that my grandparents did have to pay tuition, was the fact that, that you had to undergo uh, catechism or to... But, to study to be a Catholic, or at least to study Catholicism. Oh, yes, I, I remember it very well. I, too, was raised in uh, a Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, looking at the world today as, as a Catholic who, wa who walked away from a corrupt church long ago, mm -hmm. uh, I am glad that I was raised with uh, the values of the Ten Commandments. It's a core. <coughs> and that... Um, that I was spared. I was spared another kind of indoctrination. Uh, so, can we move on to the um, the time after, or at time you left high school? I think you said. And let me then, let me just get to one point. Uh, okay. Point, sir, and then I'll, sure. I'll move quickly into it. Sure. I know our time is limited. While I was going to the, to the uh, school, I had to take catechism across the street, and this was given by a couple of Franciscan priests. And uh, one of the priests, the name of Father Colin Donahue, he was uh, um, a, y a young priest into the order, and uh, he was very good at what he was doing, but uh, he became, he was starting to become a little too familiar with things. I mean, we was in a little office with just a table, two chairs, and a crucifix on the wall, and um, there was a sign on the wall that was, I think, taken from the Bible regarding communion. It, it uh, said that whoever shall eat of my body shall have everlasting life. And I apologize to anyone because you might find out why I've said this. And I'm not being disrespectful or sacrilegious, so please forgive me. I'm just stating facts. But go ahead. Uh, it, it wasn't too long uh, that after getting into catechism and Father Carl and I becoming rather close, in fact, a little too close, Father Colin kicked his sandals off one day and uh, started playing footsie under the table. And it wasn't uh, too quickly did I find out too many things I didn't want to know about the church, and that was the fact that the Franciscan priest who wore those robes, they didn't wear any pants under them or even including underwear, but anyways, uh, Father Colin, after I, I felt forced to submit the way that I was approached, and it was either that or go back to the public school or submit to this, what was becoming a new type of devastating life. But, That's terrible. Um, That's terrible. But the, the thing is, is... Um, uh, one day, Father uh, Donahue got up out of his chair. He came over to me, and uh, he performed a, a, a oral uh, a copulation on me. And um, that's when the things started happening a little too quick. Uh, he was amongst a rather elite uh, group of people that that in the in in the uh, ref I'm sorry, in the parish that I was living in, which was seven miles away, he was friends with the parish priest. 
And I remember one time in the summertime, I was laying home. And this was when we was out of school and I was laying in the bed. And uh, his father, Fay, who was at the, the parish priest, he came in. We didn't lock our doors in West Virginia. Nobody did. We just had screen doors with a hook on and nobody even bothered to lock the door. But uh, I was laying in, in the living room uh, on the sofa. Father Fay came in, and I was I was sound asleep. And um, it wasn't, but a few minutes after that, that I felt something was strange. It wasn't a dream, and it was a warm feeling that I was experiencing uh, between my legs. And Father Colin had told uh, Father Fay what was what uh, he had experienced with me, and so he taken the same privilege to do that. Well, this was going back and forth, and it, was, it went on for several months in my junior and senior year of school. Uh, you know, like the, about two months before graduation, I just couldn't take it anymore. Even though I was in a, 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 in this, the capital city of Charleston, seven miles away from my home, but my attitude, my character, everything started changing, and the experience that I was having with these two priests, I considered, to be honest with you, as rape, even though I was not given, actually, the opportunity to say no. It's I agree with you. I agree with you, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Merrick. This is a form of victimization that thousands of people have gone through, and, and it was not uh, even recent. Uh, my father had a loathing of going to church, uh, when uh, when I was growing up, he would only go at Christmas and Easter, but he was he just couldn't stand being there. And later on, he took me aside and he said to me, Robert, the reason I hate going to church is that when I was a boy like you, I was very devoted. I I wanted to be I was an altar boy. I wanted to be a priest. And then one of those priests tried to rape me, and from then on, I knew and I I couldn't go to church anymore. So your your story is is a, a very common theme, and now that sunshine is uh, coming into this very dark pit of uh, of corruption in all the churches, it's not just the Catholic Church. This kind of thing is going on in all religions, and what you have been describing to me, Mr. Merritt, I recognize as the foundations of what is called trauma-based mind control. So with that, I will uh, elucidate later. But let's continue uh, with your story. And so this abuse continued. Did you graduate, or did you just decide? No, to... no, I, I didn't. I never graduated. I don't have a diploma. Okay. Uh, but you had uh, the education. Th that's that's what counts. This this was going on into the early part of uh, 1961, and I'm sorry, 62, 62 was supposed to, uh, May of that year was supposed to have been my graduation, but. But uh, as I, these priests were becoming too familiar with me, my body, and this new sexual experience that I was having, and then I was getting to the point where I just didn't object to it anymore. I completely submitted to it. My character, my personality was changing. People that I tried to hide the alcoholism from my mother in my community uh, seven miles away from the school was noticing changes in me. And that, uh, uh, you know, one day I was uh, either... Uh, uh, very effeminate or very masculine and my nickname on the streets and in school I mean my family was called Butch and Butch of course has a different meaning in the gay world it means a masculine gay male right I guess that they would apply to me because uh, I could I could turn it off turn it on when I wanted to uh, but I, I, I was so confused I didn't like being involved in in that part anyways but Anyways, to make long story short, I did not finish my school, and uh, the community, my friends, neighbors, and even including family, was noticing changes in me because of the introduction to homosexuality in the gay world. By the way, gay was never used during that time. Gay, the word gay never came out until like in the early 60s. It was called either queer or faggot or whatever. Right. So, it was uh, not, that was part of part of the uh, leftist movement to. Um, well, actually, it was a propaganda tool. It was appropriated, and the word was uh, twisted to mean one specific uh, lifestyle, which which made meaningless the term the gay 90s, you know? And I point out to people that 
being gay had no uh, insinuation or association with uh, homosexuality and that's why the gay 90s were gay people were happy full of mirth and cheer and uh, their joy in life uh, so there is a lexicon there is a lexicon of seduction involved in the propagandization of uh, many uh, leftist movement or so-called leftist causes that are being used to uh, undermine this country and destabilize it and it is uh, I'm saying to people as I, I have lived history I'm just a bit younger than you are that as far as I'm concerned we're back in 1963 you know, yes, uh, we I, have I, we I, have an equivalent of a Cuban Missile Crisis. We have yes. the social division, uh, but the this is also, to a large part, exaggerated by the mass media. Because I'll tell you, in New York City, we don't have this uh, this civil unrest and this uh, you know fundamental uh, racial antagonism. People. Are, are very pleasant to each other, uh, to me, African Americans and people of all races. And I think New York is an example of where people can live harmoniously, all together, all races, colors, and creeds. But uh, let's go on with your account and how you went from, from that, uh, leaving uh, high school before graduation, but you were well educated by, by, the, um, by the Catholic Church. Uh, tell us how you got involved in uh, the, um, uh, let's call it the covert work that you, were, you started to do and how, how you came to be recruited into that. All right, before I get into that, I just want to say that the only thing that I want to note about West Virginia was is in school, uh, you know, we, we did put emphasis on uh, saying the Pledge of Allegiance or saying the Constitution or civil rights or saying the Lord's Prayer in a moment, or somebody died in the community, it was always a moment of silence. Uh, and to touch on the word gay, by the way, there was nothing happy in my life about that word. Uh, exactly I what I meant. Was... Exactly what I meant. They, uh, yes, they yes, lured yes. people, they, they lured people with a, with a very pleasant word, uh, yes. su suggesting that that was what they would, what would they, the reward they would reap would be kind of happiness. But, it's far from that, as you will surely let us know. I had uh, uh, I had left West Virginia right at the same time uh, in the fall of the year. At the same time, uh, I can't remember the exact date. I'm, I'm sure you would know uh, the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, I had worked in his his uh, campaign office with a judge, James Mellon, from Boston. This was the famous Mellon family. And West Virginia was a very anti-Catholic state, by the way, extremely anti-Catholic. And it was only myself and Judge Mellon who uh, worked in the office. I remember I had to go out in the mountains and walk for miles and miles to deliver campaign literature. And uh, I was thrown, I had sticks and rocks thrown at me and spit on and called all the uh, nice, pleasant um, anti-Catholic names, which didn't apply to me because I, I never, I was never really a convert into the church. but. But of course, he associated anybody with Kennedy being uh, being Catholic. And but uh, strange though, I mean, it was. Um, I, I did have dinner, by the way, with uh, Jackie and um, uh, the president. Uh, oh, right really? Before he, uh, when he won the uh, primary, there, it was West Virginia actually who who was responsible for pulling uh, the president into the White House. Yes, was, if I may, I would like to refresh uh, the public's memory. Many of whom don't know this extremely important fact if President Kennedy had not won the West Virginia primary he would never have become president of the United States as small as West Virginia is as few electoral votes as it has the the magnitude of having to win was paramount because Kennedy's Catholicism was anathema to the South in general and the West as well and West Virginia being a, a fundamentally Protestant state posed a very great challenge to uh, Kennedy so much so that they had to pay Sam Giancana two million dollars to uh, re to uh, win the election they they sent two million dollars there in campaign funds as it's called to uh, ensure that uh, Kennedy would win the primary 
and it's very it's quite memorable you know that they were depicting um, Kennedy as a spoiled brat you know privileged uh, uh, rich man's son and the day that I'll tell you this is what won won West Virginia for President Kennedy two things one was an address to uh, Protestant ministers down there but the one that really wanted for him was he was walking amongst a bunch of uh, uh, miners, I believe it was coal miners and workers, and one of them said to him, Mr. Kennedy, I've heard that you have never worked a single day in your life. And, pre and President-to-be uh, Kennedy, candidate Kennedy, he paused and he said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, that, that is true. And, and the fellow said to him, well, sir, you haven't missed a damn thing. <laughs> and, he, and he made it a very humorous uh, encounter. And then, of course, when he gave an address to a, a large, I mean, there must have been uh, 400 uh, Protestant ministers in there, and he, he disavowed any submission to the papacy and made sure they understood that he was his own man and that he was there as a defender of the Constitution and he got a rousing uh, ovation, and he won the West Virginia primary. So you contributed greatly to um, that element in history, as I did that so also in New York. I had the privilege of uh, working here as a you know, pamphleteer. They didn't have internet in those days, folks. So it was like uh, arms and legs running up and down stairs and buildings in New York, and as, as I'm sure in, in West Virginia. So... Lucky you, you had dinner with President Kennedy, uh, President to be Kennedy, and uh, let's continue your saga, Mr. Merritt. Well, it was the day before and the day of election for the president. Um, people were at the at the polls, and they were blatantly saying, you know, uh, oh, uh, they were ripping his posters up, and they were saying, you know, nobody's going to vote for this uh, this GD Catholic and all this stuff. So the Pope is going to move over here from Rome. He's going to be in the White House and. We're going to have hot and cold holy water installed in the White House. And I mean, it's such trivial uh, BS that people were saying that a lot of actually believe that stuff. Um, they were talking about even erecting statues uh, on the lawn of the uh, White House. One was to be dedicated to uh, to Mary. Um, and uh, they were going to pass out free rosaries. So this was all totally untrue. But uh, anyways... Um, uh, I I got acquainted in meeting with him and, and his wife and and uh, met several other Kennedy uh, Kennedys during that dinner and they were you know some of the best people around but but you know everybody at the day of the election you know as soon as they come out of the polls they'd be whispering you know, well now uh, who did you vote for who did you vote for you didn't vote for that damn Kennedy did you and they whispered back and yes I voted for Kennedy <laughs> that's all the so-called bigots of Kennedy actually went out and voted for him. Oh, that's, that's a good story. Mr. Uh, Merritt, we are going yes. to take a short break, and we'll, just, we'll be back in, uh, in just a minute. We have to have a station break. Sure. So hold on there, and I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. This is Revolution Radio and the Morning Star Report. This is Robert Morningstar, and I'm interviewing Mr. Robert Merritt, the author of Watergate Exposed. We've uh, some we've uh, given a summation of Mr. Merritt's um, early youth and his uh, travails in uh, in high school, where he uh, suffered uh, sexual abuse, quite plainly stated, sexual abuse from priests that caused him to leave school before graduation and then get involved with uh, the Kennedy campaign. And, and we're at that point in his life where uh, President Kennedy had won the primary and he had the privilege of sitting at dinner with President-to-be and Mrs. Kennedy. So let us continue, Mr. Merritt. Uh, I want to say that this was, I never thought about it before, but actually this was the beginning of the American Revolution in a sense. I mean, you know, here we... We're getting a first Catholic president who was extremely uh, bigoted against. Uh, I was uh, uh, raped and seduced into a homosexual world that, that I was told was the worst thing you could possibly do or be. And uh, it was pointed out so many times that if you're going to be 
be a homosexual. And, and the Bible does say it very plain and clear that any type of laying down with the same sex was an abomination in the eyes of God. And uh, all these things were striking me at home, but at the same time I was starting to rebel against them. I was rebelling against the people who who taunted me. And um, I thought, well, this is my way of getting even. I'm going to leave the state and uh, go to, go somewhere and, and start my own revolution. And uh, it was uh, during this time of uh, the Kennedy assassination and then Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was becoming news. And um, they were talking about the first real big march on Washington, D.C., and a thing called the Tent City. The Tent City was hundreds of thousands of tents. It was placed on the Washington Monument uh, Mall that where demonstrators had traveled all over the entire country. Some of them traveled actually from other countries to be here. And um, I know we were sleeping in mud and, and uh, unable to take a shower or bathroom things for us for a week or so until until they started making arrangements. But, but the thing is, we were happy together and uh, everybody had their own stories to tell. And everybody there was some form of revolution uh, one way or the other. I mean, it was not only just the people who it was there because of the anti-Catholic and the president becoming the first Catholic president. It was not uh, one of the biggest things, of course, was the homosexual world that was beginning to open up. But then you had people who, who uh, were involved in the women's movements, who you know the women was receiving recognition and rights for the first time in their lives, as far as jobs and uh, equal pay and equal jobs. Uh, there were so many, many doors opening up. The the thing with uh, uh, integration was certainly opening up the, uh, the, the blacks, the whites, uh, the civil rights movements. Uh, everything was beginning to happen so quickly all at once. But anyway, I got on the freedom train with Dr. King and traveled to uh, Washington, D.C. And then we were in one of the largest, the largest uh, demonstration at that time uh, as, as far as going on the nation's capital and uh, stating as to who we are and the changes the history was making, and uh, we were part of that history. But I settled down in D.C. and um, had help of a few friends I had met there, and they helped me to get a place to stay and uh, get uh, clothing. All my clothing was totally ruined from living in Tent City. But anyways, I got a job, and my first job that I had, mind you, I was only uh, I was only uh, 18 years old, and I was working as a diener or a post-mortem technician for a children's hospital in Washington, D.C., and my job was to remove the hearts and the, the aortas from children, from babies, uh, from birth up to the age of 21, because the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, it was called, was studying the diseases on uh, children's, uh, children's hearts and the aortas. And... Um, so my job was to go in either during an autopsy or after the completion of one and remove the heart in order to uh, remove it and then to ship it, pack it properly to, to go over to the uh, uh, National Institutes uh, for research. Uh, my job was only not only at Children's, but I had to go and uh, the government had contracted all the hospitals so every time a child would die under age 21, I had to go from various hospitals, including the city morgue, uh, to to remove those uh, those uh, organs from the bodies. But I, altogether, I had done 1,499 autopsies. I wanted to say that during this time, there was no such thing as Medicaid or food stamps or basically welfare. Welfare was like giving out commodities. Commodities mean a box of cheese, a bag of rice, a bag of fried beans, a can of uh, beef. Um, that was the assistance that you got from uh, from the government. Yeah, powdered and, milk. <clears throat> powdered milk from World War II. So yes, exactly. And and to get those items, it was you were considered to be a disgrace and a shame upon the community. So you had to travel. Um, in West Virginia, we had to travel up in what we call a holler, which was a place between two mountains, uh, several miles back on a dirt road, to some little wooden shack out there where you'd have one person distributing this stuff to people. And the, I remember the ladies who were without husbands or had been abandoned or deserted, 
you know, they had to get their their uh, fathers or their neighbors would to drive them up there, and it was all done very, uh, very so clandestinely, and it was so done in such secrecy that you thought that people committing a crime, the crime is the way that people were treated. But uh, anyway, getting back to Washington, D.C., I stayed on the job as a post-mortem technician for about two or three years until one day there was a, a child that was brought down to the uh, morgue, and I accidentally pricked my hand on the point of a scalpel. And even though I was wearing two pairs of gloves, but the blood went, it had gone into my skin, just a small little teeny tiny pinpoint prick. But, but I, several days after that, I became very, very sick, and uh, my skin turned very dark. My hair turned almost silver, and it turned out I was sitting in a restaurant trying to eat a hamburger, and I, I just fell on the floor, and next thing I knew, I was in a hospital. And uh, I remember in the hospital, I was being taken in by the ambulance on a cot, and the, my, my parents had changed so drastically that they didn't know whether I was black or white. My skin was had turned very dark. My hair had turned silver, and uh, uh, it, I had hepatitis, is what the child had died from, and so I was in quarantine for about three months. Obviously, when I got out of the hospital, I had lost my job, and so I had taken different other types of jobs, working as as waiters or bus boys or whatever. During that time, it was pretty easy to find a job, and even without a high school diploma, we didn't need a diploma to be a waiter or a bus boy, but but the thing, I had walked into so many clerical positions and told them that I was experienced with several years of college since I even knew. Nobody ever questioned it. Uh, even generated and made uh, phony transcripts and um, even a high school diploma and even a, a college degree with six months experience on it. This is when computers were coming out and they were studying computers. And the computers in that time was two huge, massive computers called the 1401, 1402 IBM computers. And it was the computer is as big as a car, and they had a, a board that you had to pull out. and had thousands of little wires, different color wires. You had to put them in different holes to be able to program the computer to get what you wanted. It was, it was uh, very, very frustrating. But, but anyways, I managed to get through, and then we're getting up into the years of, of uh, this was like 1962-63, and then I managed to keep myself alive and keep going until... Around the year of 1968, I think it was 68, 69, and then it was all over the news that uh, there was rats in New York City, the Stonewall rats, and this was, I think, you're you're the best one to describe that, uh, Robert. Right. Well, in um, in the 1960s, Hello. Uh, in the 1960s. Hello, Mr. Morningstar. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry that uh, I had a technical problem here for a moment. Yes, in the 1960s, uh, the gay activist movement was growing uh, uh, very uh, quickly in uh, San Francisco, in New York, in major cities. And one of the uh, watering holes, a very uh, popular gay bar, was uh, called uh, the Stonewall. And at that time, the government, uh, the New York City government administration and the police department were very anti-homosexual and wanted to curtail those activities. So there was a, a huge police raid of this establishment with a lot of beatings and broken heads and, uh, riot, and it spurred riots that uh, brought uh, national attention to um, basically this was police abuse of people engaging in their own private civil rights. So it put the national spotlight on it and it created a furor and uh, it was really the springboard for large scale uh, national and international um, uh, pro-gay rights activism. So you can take it from there. It was going when those riots had started. I mean, I had come to Washington DC with the intent of starting my own revolution, at least within myself. I didn't expect to be involved literally with thousands of people, and that's the way it turned out. I was not never considered myself a leader, but as an Indian, and uh, quickly overnight, it, I had just changed roles and put on a war bonnet, and I was uh, very active in the, in the gay world and had 
completely come out of the closet, I guess you could say. At least I thought that was the type of life that I wanted to live, and I did live it this a few years. But I, I moved to an area called DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. DuPont Circle was a round park that was uh, quite large and uh, had many intersections. One intersection leading directly into the White House, the Washington Monument, another one going into Georgetown uh, on a street called P Street. That's where I lived. And I was sort of between the park and uh, the Georgetown area. Georgetown was uh, mostly the 99% white affluent uh, community, very powerful um, uh, very segregated. Um, those with the the elitist, the most cultured, uh, who live there, the ones with professional status, not only the politicians, but these were the professors, the doctors, the surgeons, and uh, the politicians from the entire area. And um, I had, the my circle was a place where it was a, a very diversified community from from uh, you could be it didn't matter whether you was American Nazi or uh, um, belong to a Hitler group or to being a Republican a Democrat or to uh, Ku Klux Klan a Black Panther a, a gay group a women's rights group whatever your political stand was you could do it, go there and you could feel most comfortable because it was not a place for political platforms. It was a place for social gathering. And people, I must say, despite their weird and diversity of politics, got along extremely well together. Um, they would express their views, but it was nothing, uh, there was never any violence there. Um, sometimes the conversations would get a little heated, of course, but um, it was a very interesting, very fascinating place. Um, another intersection. Uh, around that, there was I think eight or ten of them, maybe. But anyway, another one was called Embassy Row, and that's where all the embassies were, and and uh, stretched out for a couple of miles, uh, leading from the circle out into the Georgetown area. Um, there was just, just each avenue like almost represented itself in different sorts of ways. But anyways, I had let myself down. I had become friends with just about everybody there. It, it didn't matter to me what their political platform was. I could care less. It, I wasn't there for that purpose. I was there to make friends, to be wanted, to be accepted, and to rebel against those people back in West Virginia who made me feel very unwelcome, and to rebel against those priests who sexually raped me. I'm not going to use the word abused or molested because it wasn't. It was rape. Um, but uh, anyway, anyways, uh, I was been hanging out at the circle. Uh, um, I had lived only about a block away from it and worked in another direction, uh, working at a, a drugstore. I was about two blocks from the White House as a cashier on the uh, cigarette and tobacco uh, department in the, in the drugstore. And I noticed that, um, you know, of course the park you know, was inundated with uh, the hippies too. And um, um, you couldn't tell people as to how they were dressed or how they presented themselves. I mean, you had people there who might have been a, uh, I'm sorry, I don't like the words, but I'll say it, a transgender, or the word I know is drag queen. They might have been a drag queen, but they could have been maybe uh, somebody who uh, enjoyed putting on their white female clothing at home. So you really couldn't tell who was what or what they were doing. But uh, there was one young man who was a hippie, and uh, of course almost everybody there smoked pot. I did not try it. I didn't like it. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, he kept watching me for, for quite a long period of time. It became very annoying because I thought he was trying to, uh, I thought he was trying to pick me up because there was a lot of uh, sexual uh, transgressions in that park, and that they you know, would uh, pick people up late at night. But anyways, I, like I said, I was working at a drugstore at the end of the week. I was only making $70 a week. $35 a week was my rent. I had $35 to live on. I was living from paycheck to paycheck and from my mouth to my hand, and that was it. But anyways, uh, I picked up my check that Friday, 
uh, as I always did for a couple of years. And uh, uh, the owner of the place um, told me, he said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you go. And he fired me without any explanation. And um, did so in a very pleasant manner. And there was nothing I could say or do. I asked the reason why. And he said, well, it's not important. He said, the best thing is we, we part being friends. And he said, and I always like you. He said, you're a very nice person. And I went home totally dismayed, upset, and stressed out over this. And there was a knock on the door. And uh, I opened the door, and it was the same young man who had been watching me at DuPont Circle. And uh, he was a white guy in his... Uh, uh, early 20s, he had uh, long brown hair, mustache, goatee, dressed in army fatigue type of clothing, and uh, and, and raggedy clothing. He was a typical uh, hippie, or at least he thought he was, but he uh, introduced himself as uh, Carl, and he said, can I come in? I said, well, I don't know who you are, what do you want? I had suspicions it was a, a sexual trash of some type, and... and uh, he goes, I just want to talk to you. He says, I promise you. He says, there's nothing for anyone. He says, I will leave. He says, anytime you ask me to. And so I let him come in. He immediately, he was very aggressive. He immediately pulled out a bag of weed. He lit it up and asked me to join him. And I did only for about a half of a uh, roach, and that was it. Uh, he asked me, he told me that he had been watching me, profiling me for over years so at the behest of the government and that uh, they were looking for people like me who who uh, uh, who became involved with all the different people at the circle who was accepted and was was accepted without any questions. I said, what is it you want me to do? Mr. Merrick, and, uh, may I ask, yes. uh, you said that he introduced himself as an agent of a government agency that he'd been profiling you. Can you tell us which agency it was? Yes, he worked for the Metropolitan Police Department, was the idea that he showed me. But uh, when he got in, he only introduced himself as Carl until he got in the door. Then when he pulled out the weed and, and we started smoking that, then the conversation went from from uh, uh, formal to informal. And then he asked me, could he take a shower? I said, go ahead. Uh, I mean, it was a type of atmosphere. So he wants to take a shower, so take one. Who cares? Um, you know, but anyway, he took a shower. He came out, and he was butt naked, and he... I said, uh, I, I said, aren't you getting a little drafty in here? Don't you think you need to put something on? And he said, oh, come on and join me. He jumped in my bed, which was uh, a big open space between my living room and my bedroom, only separated by a draw drape. And uh, he said, oh, come on. And I said, I said, suspected this is what this was all about. He said, well, no, not really. He said, but this is my first time. He said, I want to make sure, he said, that um, uh, that I'm, I'm sure about myself. And he said, uh, I hope you don't mind me experimenting with you. I said, well, I, I don't know whether to take that kindly or not. But but uh, anyway, we we did have sex, and he, uh, I can assure you, it was not his first time. And that was a bunch of BS. But he, um, I went along with him, and then he finally told me that, um, uh, that he was working as a detective with the Metropolitan Police Department. And... The idea that he showed me was it was uh, from the police department, but uh, he wanted to know could he move in. I said, "My God, you've then pulled out weed. We've already had sex, and you got me fired from my job." He did give me an envelope with thirty five hundred dollars in it, which I was very happy to receive, not knowing how I was going to pay my rent the following week. And um, then he said, "Can I ask what do you want to move in for?" And he says, "Well, because I'm undercover. He said, I want you to work with me if you're going to take the assignment." I said, you didn't even ask me if I want to take an assignment. I don't know what assignment you told me. He said, well, I he said, I'm involved in bank robberies and uh, narcotics. Then he said, you, he said, you uh, move around. He said, in so many different circles. I thought maybe you'd be the best person. And so did the government to to uh, move around these people. He said, and get, get acquainted. I said, okay, fine. He, uh, I'm cutting things very short because of the time. But anyways, he uh, uh, he did move in, and the precinct where he was from was only... Uh, they called the second district. It was only a, a couple blocks or so from my home, but he didn't want to be seen going to the to the district. I mean, Dupont Circle area was quite big area, and uh, he he'd spotted being seen in and out of the, the precinct. They they would have thought well, he was a narc or a narcotics uh, uh, undercover. So I went along with him and thought, well, what could it hurt? And so the first month or so uh, was 
he was asking me to make uh, buys and purchases of narcotics for the government. And he gave me money one time to buy uh, a stuff called crystal methadrine from a woman named Lonnie Max. Lonnie Max lived in the, on the borderline of the DuPont Circle in Georgetown and uh, was separated by a creek called Rock Creek Park and a bridge there. And uh, anyways, uh, he... He and the other detectives were outside watching me uh, uh, about a block away, and um, he asked me questions when I bought the drug. I gave it to them, and uh, you know I had already paid her inside for the stuff. And he said, "Well, who is the young lady sitting on the porch as you went in?" I said, "That's her daughter." I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, how old do you think she is?" I said, "I don't know, Cross, maybe 12, 13 years old." He said, "Oh, really?" He said, "Well, she's very cute, don't you think?" I said, "Yes, she's very young, don't you think?" And um, he said, well, not really. He said, if she's old enough to bleed, she's old enough to butcher. And I said, okay, to myself. And um, anyways, um, this narcotics thing came to a quick close. Um, I actually did give him cases in solving two bank robberies. But it moved from that, like, overnight to the Metropolitan Police Department's Intelligence Division. And he told me that they were very, very interested in me because of who I was. To make a long story short, I found out that I was actually the only under, they called them undercover agents, not informants during the time, uh, that worked for the department. And it was the, uh, they wanted information collected on all the different political activities. They wanted license plate numbers. They wanted telephone numbers. They wanted names. They wanted addresses. They wanted, uh, uh, they wanted me to steal mail. They wanted me to forge documents. They wanted me to break into places. I had I broke. I had infiltrated like over 200 and some different private and governmental uh, funded uh, organizations for them. Uh, uh, the um, uh, one of the biggest places was the Institute for Policy Studies, which was a Kennedy uh, funded uh, organization that studied Marxism, Leninism, and uh, um, that sort of thing, and they they wanted me and socialism. They wanted me to try to get a job there, uh, just to be a snoop. They said that the place was very dangerous. It was un-American. It was communist, and that the, that's basically the type of people that we had in the Kennedy family. That they weren't as royal or red, white, and blue as people thought they were. And uh, I was totally just made at that one because of my connection to the Kennedys in West Virginia, but. Uh, anyway, I never did take the job. It was a chauffeur gardener job for Ethel Kennedy, working at the Kennedy home. And um, so I, I declined that job. I told him I didn't want to move out of the area to, to go there. It's taken. I understand I had to live on on the Kennedy property. Uh, so they anyway. they wanted you to be uh, become a spy in the Kennedy enclave, correct? You wanted to be yes. a, to be an informant exactly. on Robert Kennedy. Exactly. Exactly. Any Kennedy during this time, any Kennedy. Um, but um, anyway, I declined that job, and then uh, uh, I did not get the job they wanted me to do at the Institute for Policy Studies, which I was happy about because it was just a bit too much over my head, and I wasn't really that interested in all that sophisticated culture and intellectual conversations they were having. And um, uh, so they kept me down to just infiltrating different groups to... The gay groups was the number one uh, thing at the time. Now, after, I, I skipped over something I shouldn't have, and that was during the time that the Stonewall riots happened, uh, you know, that was in New York. I thought that something should take place in the nation's capital, so I started an organization called GLF, the Gay Liberation Front, and I was the founder of that group. And it started off with just a couple dozen uh, men and, um, and women. And... Um, uh, it was just a, a, a like local chapter anyway, but it was actually becoming a national headquarters. But uh, we had put out a newspaper and the uh, title, it was only a two-page paper actually, and I just said that the title was in big letters, it said, uh, uh, Argue One Two. And uh, under it it read, the person handing you this uh, newsletter is a homosexual, Argue One Two. And we were told to pass them out to the FBI agents and the um, Justice Department and whatever uh, other organizations, the police department, all those different places uh, that would offend people in the government. Would, uh, and it made quick, very quick news as well. Uh, 
Mr. Merritt, and, uh, excuse me, we have to come uh, to another station uh, identification break, and mm -hmm. we will be back in one minute. So please hold that sure. thought, and we will continue the story of Watergate Exposed. This is Revolution Radio, and this is the Morning Star Report with my guest, Mr. Robert Merritt, the author of Watergate Exposed, who's been telling us about his career as an undercover agent with the Metropolitan Police, who uh, then moves on to other operations on behalf of the government in surveillance. He just told us the story of having been asked to take a job on the estate of Robert F. Kennedy as a uh, gardener and a chauffeur, but he declined it because because of personal reasons and uh, his desire to stay in Washington. So, Mr. Merritt, please uh, mm -hmm. continue continue your story. We were at the, uh, um, the formation of your organization. May I ask before we go on, when you formed this organization, was it on behalf of the um, agency you were working for, or did you think of it on your own? and Keep, keep, uh, as a side, the, the, as the a paper side. you mean? Uh, yes, you were saying the pamphlet. That was on my own. That was on your own. Okay, but, yes. well, please continue. The uh, one of the biggest pieces the government had with me and all the different agencies was that I wouldn't obey orders. I did things on my own, and uh, they liked it and they didn't like it. They they said you're quite genius in some of the things that you come up with, things that you do, but you don't tell us about them, you just go ahead and do them. And said, so we're used to following orders. I said, well, you wear a badge and a gun. I don't. I don't have to follow your orders. And um, anyways, uh, there were so many other things they had me to get involved with. I mean, I met, you know, H. Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael um, of the uh, uh, Black Panther Party. And um, um, I was taken to their home on a Sunday morning and was introduced to them and I had casual drinks with them. To make a long story short there too, it, that became a, a sexual thing. It was four of us involved in the many, many orgy, you might say, but it wasn't too long after that that they found, or they claimed, that uh, H. Rap Brown had uh, faked his own death by taking the bones of the body of a pig and putting it in a car and wrecking the car somewhere on the Washington, D.C. Beltway or Turnpike. And uh, <clears throat> anyways, they, all they found was the charred bones, but the FBI put it together very quickly that these were the bones of an animal, not of a human being. Uh, they did discover H. Rep. Brown a few years later, and he was on the run with new identity. And uh, he was wanted in Washington, D.C. for, I think, killing a police officer or starting riots, uh, inciting riots, that was uh, his thing. Um, but uh, him and Stokely, Mark, Sto Stokely Carmichael were secret lovers that nobody knew about. And in fact, the black community and the historians get very upset when I tell that story. They think that I'm trying to defame people who were of uh, extreme political interest. Well, I'm not. I'm telling the truth. And the fact is, uh, I really wouldn't want Stokely Carmichael or Rap Brown to represent me in any historical way as far as being black. But um, there were other things. I mean, the, the House of Prayer Church was being ran and operated uh, by the Grace family. And the Grace family was a man, I think he started off in New York City as they called him Daddy Grace. And Daddy Grace had churches that was popping up all over the eastern part of the United States. And it was called the, uh, the House of Prayer for All Peoples. And... Um, Daddy Grace was somebody that they opened up the center doors uh, to the church and rolled down a red carpet all the way to the street when Daddy Grace would pull up in his limo to come into the church. <clears throat> he had he had the authority, just like uh, Jim Jones did, to have sex with any man, woman, or child that he so desired. And he was a pimp in New York, and he was into gambling, he was into narcotics, he was into many, many things, the FBI and government had been watching him for many years. But um, uh, I had become very close to getting to know uh, the Grace family, and uh, they trusted me to, to 
to a very large degree. Uh, uh, so many people ask me constantly, especially uh, agents and special agents, you know, how do you get to know these people? How do they trust you? Uh, you know, after all, I mean, you're just an average uh, average white man. I mean, why are they going to, um, uh, why do they, they trust you like this? We couldn't do that. I said, what's the secret with you? And I said, well, that's my secret. It's a secret. But the fact is they had made a mistake in what they had said because uh, getting back to, to my family in West Virginia, it was my great-grandmother who uh, came over here on one of the boats from England or somewhere France or whatever that uh, uh, came to this country and she had to marry a Christian man to get into this country where she she was white but she was Jewish and Jewish women were not permitted to come into this country unless they were secretly married to a uh, uh, to a white man and so that's how she got here but then little was it known too that my mother my mother died in 1972 and um, from alcoholism and she had told me that any, when she died, that there was an envelope. She wanted me to open up it in the bottom drawer of her dresser, and she said, "Open up and read it. She will be shocked." And I did. It was a, it was an obituary of a, of a young black man. He was very, very light skinned. He had green eyes. He had sandy, blonde, uh, curly hair, not nappy, but curly. And uh, his name was Joseph Booker. Well, it turned out that he was my father, and uh, my mother and him had a affair when they were 15, 16 years old, something that was forbidden. In West Virginia, if a couple of there had gotten married or had sexual relationships between interracials, like that, they would have been, they would have been jailed. They probably would have been killed. Uh, there was a couple of young black men who was hung up on the bridge when I was living there as a child. I remember it very well that. We went to the city one day, and here was these two men swinging from the bridge with ropes around the neck, and there were two young black men who was accused of raping a white woman, and uh, it turned out that neither one of them had anything to do with the rape. It was done by a white man who lived not too far from her, but they were they actually broke into the jail, took these two men out, and uh, killed them. But if you had a child by uh, interracial marriage, the child was taken away from you and put up to the state, or maybe the child was given a little black pill. I don't know. But the thing is, is that the, the mother and the father both were looking at strenuous jail sentences, 10 to 20 years, for, for daring to, to have sex with each other, much less to have a child. But here I am, you know, my great grandmother was Jewish, my father was black. His mother, my father's mother, by the way, was uh, with an American Indian. His uh, father was black. Uh, I, so I'm Jewish and I'm half black and part Indian, and and then I'm forcibly made gay by these priests. I think that wherever I could put my toes, I got wet and. Uh, uh, it just never seemed to stop, and every time I would turn turn a corner, it would be a new secret opening up, especially within our family uh, or in the community. But um, anyways, my my work during that time was uh, was to infiltrate. I'm so, I'm sorry if I'm getting confusing to the people. I'm sure I am, but you're gonna have to forgive me because I'm looking at the clock. No, it's okay. Uh, I just we have. Um... Oh, I would say uh, about 16 to 17 minutes before the next break. But okay. uh, yes, uh, go on with your story. It's it's a very fascinating okay. story. It, it, during the from September of 1971 up until the first part of May of 1972, I'm still living at the same address. I'm still carrying on the same basic activities. Carl Schaffler was still my so-called secret lover, uh, which was a joke on him. But anyways, um, uh, I'm still doing the same thing, hanging out with the same people, meeting new people all the time in DuPont Circle. I'm becoming more and more familiar with uh, the drag queen set. They 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 love being around me because of my name. You know, Butch, Butch, man, I told you it means a masculine gay male. And these people were, were uh, they, they were drag queens. They weren't them. They were drag queens. In fact, a couple of them looked absolutely so real that you could, you would not be able to tell the difference. There was one in particular, uh, <clears throat> the name of Rita Reed, 
His real name was James Reed. He happened to be from West Virginia, too. And uh, I, I've only seen Rita in male clothing, only when he would go to work at night, but then the clothing he would wear, it would be, it was really women's clothing, but they were tucked in, so he did, it could have been like a unisex you know, type of thing. But um, anyways, Rita, uh, around May, came to me and was petrified and said, uh, Butch, Butch, please, I, I've got to talk to you. He said, uh, it's, it's very, very important. It's a, uh, it's a secret I have to talk to you. Well, Rita hated Carl. They did not, they did not get along well together at all. And uh, so I said, well, okay, come on in. He said, no, no, no. you got that Carl here. He said, I don't, I don't like him. You know it, and I'm not going to talk around him. I said, I know he's undercover and all this stuff. So you told me that, but the thing is, I don't like him. And so, anyways, Reed asked me to take a walk uh, with her in the park, which was a P Street Beach, and it uh, was part of Rock Creek Park. But, um, uh, anyways, when we were walking there, she told me, she said, Reed had worked at the Columbia Plaza Apartments, um, which was um, uh, a building right across the street, almost, uh, from the uh, Watergate uh, complex. And... Um, uh, anyways, uh, Rita said, I have to, I have to talk to you, and we started walking in the park, and as we walked along, I was trying to find it, and I can't, as I was talking just now, there was a poem that she started reciting, and it was a silly little poem, but it made sense, but it was uh, about, you know, we're walking, uh, down on the clearing, in, going back into the woods, and the green, the trees are so green and beautiful, and the grass is green, and the, the creek has crystal uh, clear water, and somebody, ironically, uh, uh, had thrown an old gate from somebody's yard into the creek, and said, look, look, Bush, there's a gate in the water, I said, I can't believe this is really a gate. And I didn't know what she was talking about. I'm just listening. And so we walked along the path until we came out upon a clearing at the end. And we got upon the clearing at the end. Uh, Rhea said, pointed over to the Watergate complex and said, look, Butch, said, this is what I've been trying to talk to you about. I said, that building is going to be the fall of the President of the United States. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, you'll find out. And she said that she had been working on the front desk as a clerk and was working the PBF switchboard. The switchboard had the holes and the plugs and the little wires. There was three holes on the switchboard, hole one, two, and three. Never been used. They were reserved plugs for telephones to be installed somewhere else throughout the unit and a complex where they're in. And anyways, um, uh, she said the hole number two started flashing up one night, and out of curiosity and being a drag queen and closest thing to a female, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to put any females down, but uh, anyways, uh, said the hole started lighting up, she listened in, I said, and there's these people are having the strangest conversations about breaking into something at the, across the street at the Watergate complex, and it was called the DNC. She did not know what the DNC stood for, the Democratic National Committee. Um, but she was. they were also talking about the president, about, you know, we'll, we'll be rid of him, and uh, those were not the exact words. The exact words are pretty much in my book. But um, uh, anyway, she, they were making threats, bailed, and uh, direct, indirect uh, of um, the President of the United States and th those offices and, and that Watergate building. And she didn't know what any of it meant. For some reason, she thought that I knew, and I, I didn't know. But anyways, uh, the only thing that struck to me close to home was, was the, th the remark that she made, and I had been taught to, to profile, to watch people's not only their body language, but also, uh, you know, so what they dressed, how they how they carried themselves, you know, but also things that they would say, because sometimes people would be giving you a message, especially in Washington D.C., where everything was p political. I mean, you ate politics there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you never knew who was a secret agent living next door to you or whatever. But uh, I kept remembering the one thing about that's going to be the uh, end of President Nixon, and. It bothered me, so when I got home, uh, Rita went on home to get ready to go to work. She had to work the evening shift, as she always did, from 4 to 12. 
And uh, so Carl came in, and so Rita had asked me not to divulge or break that promise. That it's what she told me, and I did. And it was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. But I told Carl what the reason said. Carl got overly excited about something. And he said, I'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. And I said, he came back about an hour later with uh, an FBI agent and a retired CIA agent. And they had me to repeat the story over and over and over and over. And they seemed to be enlightened about something. They wouldn't share it with me at the time. And uh, then they asked me all kinds of personal questions about you know, Rita and where she lived, where she worked, and uh, uh, everything about her. And so, um, uh, anyways, around midnight that night, I was supposed to meet Rita, as I always did. We would go to some overnight uh, cafe or restaurant and have coffee and just sit and talk and BS. But uh, um, anyways, uh, Rita didn't show. So... I kept calling her number, no answer. Then I called again at like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, the phone was disconnected. I didn't know something's wrong. So I couldn't go to sleep for the rest of the night. So I went over to our building. First thing in the morning, I asked the resident manager there to please let me go up and see if she's okay. And she did, reluctantly so. Something was going on. Anyway, she opened the door. It was like Rita had never lived there in her entire life, or anybody for that matter. The place was spotless. Not a stick of furniture, not even a coat hanger, nothing. And everything had been cleaned up, including her little dog that uh, she always carried with her everywhere. And uh, then the woman started getting in denial. Well, I'm not sure if I know this James Reed that you're talking about lived here. So I don't think I know him. I thought, oh, wait a minute. No, Reed has been living here for about 12, 14 years, and you're going to say you don't know him, and you've met me many times with Reed. Something is definitely wrong. So I went to his job at uh, Columbia Plaza, and I got the same type of nonsense, uh, you know, from the woman who was the manager of the Columbia Plaza. I don't know him, and I don't know what you're talking about, and I'm sorry I'm busy, I'm going to have to go, and you're going to have to leave, and I appreciate you didn't come back because I really don't know what you're talking about. And uh, it was a stern warning, you know, please don't come back, or, you know, something bad's going to happen, you know, you don't have you. My impression was that you could be locked up. And, for trespassing or something, but I think it was more to that. Uh, something else was planning to happen if I went back there. Mr. Merritt, did uh, Rita reveal to you who the correspondents were, who the people were on the phone? She told me she'd listened in on dozens of phone calls, and she said she never could get that information. She said that in her own mind, after talking to me, and extensively so, and it was the first time she'd ever been filled in, on the activities at DuPont Circle, she had no idea that the people around her, that some of them were classified as dangerous or un-American or communist, whatever. But then when I explained to her, then she seemed to be getting a little fear of her association with the circle and with the people that she knew there, including me as well. She had this wall that she was building, and, and uh, it was a scary type of thing. But, but uh, no, she said... All she, she assumed and, and made up her mind that they were either FBI or CIA. That's the two groups of sheep, she said. And uh, my conclusion, to be honest with you, is, was that she was absolutely right, except that I thought also that the intelligence division was involved in it from my M MPD, Metropolitan Police Department. But uh, I think there was another, I think she's involved, like the military uh intelligence at the Pentagon from the U.S. Army. Uh, Carl, by the way, had uh, had finished his term at four years in the Army, and his old time he was there, he was being trained as an intelligence agent. And so did Robert, uh, Bob Woodward, by the way, the Washington Post reporter who broke the story on Watergate. It was also... Uh, had received a type of training. Him and Carl knew each other very well. They went to a place called Vint, V-I-N-T, Hill Farms, which was a place out in the country in an isolated area. There was being a place that was uh, several acres of uh, land that was being reserved to teach spies and CIA agents and FBI that how to do wiretapping, how to uh, plant bugs, um, 
how to take type of, certain types of photography. Um, uh, uh, everything you want to do about spy work, they taught at Vinhill Farms. And uh, Carl would come home and he would give me the same training he received during the whole day. And I caught on to it a lot, a lot faster than what he thought I would. But, but um, uh, anyways, uh, when I told Carl about what Rita had told me, this was like on June the 1st or the last day of May. I can't remember exactly right now. But uh, like I said, Carl brought in the FBI, the CIA agent. And um, then I knew there was something much big going on, but he wouldn't tell me. And I just wasn't interested in politics at the time to really be that inquisitive. If I knew what I knew today, yes, I would have been much more. Uh, but... Um, I thought that when I told Carl that he would notify somebody that there was going to be a break-in, and uh, it was planned for June the 18th, 1972, and that was on a Sunday, but Carl wasn't happy with that date. He wanted to move, change the date to June the 17th, 1972, because that was his birthday on a Saturday. Now, he was supposed to have left to go home to Pennsylvania on Friday evening at 5 o'clock when he got off from work, but he told his boss he would like to stay and volunteer uh, some uh, work. Uh, never heard of a cop wanting to volunteer time before, but he did. But um, anyways, he had already made plans during these uh, two or three weeks that uh, the information I gave. He had already involved the Watergate uh security guard, Frank Wills, a young black man who was the only security guard at the Watergate complex, they had paid and, and made uh, Frank Wills an agreement that he would uh, tape up the doors starting from the garage all the way up to the floor where the, uh, the DNC offices were. And that was supposed to be the means of entry by both the people who were planning to break in and Ironically, when they showed up to do the taping, the doors had already been taped. So they thought there was cross wires between them and somebody else, so they didn't pay much attention to it when they actually should have. But um, um, there was a lot of unusual things that happened. I mean, the doors had already been taped. The point of entry was already done. When they got up to the floor where DNC was, they really didn't even need a key because the lock had been uh, opened on the door for them just to turn the knob. And... The actual uh, word of the break-in uh, happened around like about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. That's when Frank Wills called 911 to report the uh, break-in. And um, I think he saw lights go on in the office or something. But it was, there was a lot of people watching that particular office, that, especially that night. Uh, anyways, um, when the 911 call was made, Carl, volunteering for his police job, had... had um, uh, it was parked only about a block away from the water gates, and he received the call. He immediately went there. He was the first uh, cop on the scene, and um, first responder, I guess they call it today. But anyways, when he went in, the place was dark. Everybody was quiet, and uh, he flipped the lights on and announced that he was a police and flashed his uh, flashlights, and he said that when he did so, he told me, this is a police. He said, come on out now. He said, nobody will get hurt. He said all these different hands went up in the air that was hidden behind different desks in there. And it was the burglars and uh, everybody involved in it. And uh, the one uh, Cuban who who um, had certain things in his possession, like uh, one, of the, I, I skipped over this and I shouldn't have, but, but the way that they got it changed the date from the 18th of uh, June to the 17th of uh, June for Carl's birthday, what he did was he... He pretended to have a conversation made from the DNC officers to somebody else, a totally bogus phone call, and it was to say, oh, we've left this valuable secret envelope in on somebody's desk. We cannot leave in there all weekend. Somebody's going to find it. We're all going to be in trouble. You know, we've got to get in there and get this thing out of there as quickly as possible. So that's when the date was changed. And I hope I'm making sense to people who are listening to me because I've, it's a little complicated there. But, uh, I think uh, I think it's perfectly intelligible, and you are filling in a lot of details. Everyone knows about the break-in, and that the um, 
that the security guard found the doors taped and that gave him suspicion. However, you have another angle. It seems, it seems that Rita eavesdropping, correct me if I'm wrong, that Rita, uh, Rita eavesdropping on these conversations tipped off your friend Carl who told the CIA and the FBI what was going to happen and that then they lay in wait for and to to entrap them is that that's, that's is correct okay i wanted to be Absolutely sure correct well then you are being very clear I, because if i okay. understood it the audience so understands it about six thirty in the morning um I, I was asleep in my apartment on p street carl came in through the back door and uh, uh he was still my roommate he came in and gave me a big hug and a big kiss and he said but he said you did you did you made me the most famous cop in the world he said, you're going to be the most famous undercover. He said, no, I take that back. We can't say anything about you. He said, you've got to promise me you'll give me all the credit. I said, fine, Carl. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, I had no idea what I, I really had no idea, to be honest with you. I mean, anything about Watergate or what I was involved with, I did not know at the time. And uh, So the news hadn't gotten out or hadn't gotten to you at this time. So it was a, correct? No, no. That, right. That's correct. But okay. even if it had, I was not I was not that well versed in Watergate or the politics surrounding it, and it would have meant very little of anything to me, to be honest with you. Well, if uh, you if you'll permit me, we have uh, a few minutes before the break. I would like to clarify what they were after because two nights ago I was on Richard Hoagland's show, The Other Side of Midnight, with Daniel Sheehan. And Daniel Sheehan got the whole story from, of all people, uh, Santos Traficanti, the mob boss of Miami. And what it was, it was a suspicion on the part of the Nixon administration that Larry O'Brien, who had worked for Howard Hughes, had knowledge of Howard Hughes' participation in setting up the assassination apparatus against Castro that was then turned on President Kennedy. And so they feared that Larry O'Brien had documents that would reveal that connection of Howard Hughes to the 5412 Committee, which is uh, the, the, the name of the committee in the National Security Council that's in charge of assassinations and, uh, well, not always killing people, but getting rid of undesirable un, uh, leaders or social leaders or, or uh, government leaders in other countries. So the assassination apparatus that was uh, aimed at Castro was then turned on Kennedy. And for that reason, Nixon always referred to the Kennedy assassination as the Bay of Pigs affair, which led to the deletion in the famous Watergate tapes of 18 minutes of conversation that Nixon had with Haldeman and Ehrlichman in the aftermath of the uh, Watergate event. So uh, we have three more minutes before the next uh, station break, and uh, please uh, let's continue. Uh, now, uh, we know. Yes, now we know I what they were after. Oh, I'm one sorry. more thing, one more thing. All of these members, um, all of these uh, agents that were captured in the Watergate had been involved in the JFK assassination. They were part of the JFK assassination team and included H uh, excuse me, uh, E. Howard Hunt, Gordon Liddy, um, and, and a couple of others, I believe it was five. So there you have it in a nutshell, and uh, this is amazing as to how that bust came about. So Yes, yeah, so they used other reasons, though. They said that the DNC had a catalog in there of young boys, young girls, and prostitutes and that sort of thing that uh, only the uh, higher echelon of the DNC was very interested in. This was a call, girl, call boy type of service, and... Uh, uh, to me, that was a totally false story that did not exist, and uh, uh, but yeah, it was never found. Uh, but the thing is, is you people do not understand something, and that is that the entire Watergate operations was done by Carl Schaffler, uh and he could have exposed this. It would have gone down anyways. Um, but the thing is, it was done by the police department. It was done by the intelligence division. It was done by the FBI. It was done by the CIA. It was done by the National Security Agency. It was done by the Yakima Tobacco and Farms Division. It was done by Interpol. And uh, the thing is, 
the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing. You had all these different people talking on uh, Baldwin's uh, wiretap that he had across the street. I think it was at the Howard Johnson uh, Hotel that he was tapping into DNC. Uh, you had the, the stuff that was coming out directly out of the apartment in hole number two at the Columbia Plaza. Uh, you had people on the street, you had people on the foot, you had people inside of the complex already walking around, milling around, hanging around in the lower mall part of it. There was like a park down there you could hang around, sit and talk to a female or smoke cigarettes or whatever. But it was, uh, you had all these different people there from different, but they didn't know who each other they were, uh, Mr. Morningstar. They did not know. They honestly did not know that they were there. On, on, uh, they all had different assignments, but one of the main assignments that people do not know to this day, except except a, a select few, and that is that the entire operation of the Watergate break-in was done for one purpose, and that was to get rid of the president of the United States. On that because... note, on that thought, Mr. Mr. Merritt, on that thought, let's take a one-minute station break, and. Uh, We'll be back with uh, the climax of this remarkable story. This is Robert Morningstar. This is Revolution Radio. And as you know, Revolution Radio is the world's largest uh, listener-sponsored network, radio network on the Internet. And uh, we do need your help, as well as the host, uh, to keep the Morningstar Report and the sounds of the New York City News going. I also need your support. And I have a PayPal Account, and my email is the same as robert.morningstar at gmail.com and I would greatly appreciate any help you can give me to keep the Morningstar Report, the sounds of New York City news and cognitive resonance going on Revolution Radio. Um, thank you for considering it and let's get back to the show with Mr. Robert Merritt, the author of Watergate Exposed. Mr. Merritt, please continue. Yes. Yes, like I said, the main purpose, in spite of all their other goals, was to destroy the presidency. And uh, Nixon had created a lot of enemies. And one of the main reasons was because he wanted, just like John Kennedy made a comment to people in Dallas, is that he wanted, uh, he wanted the intelligence uh, agencies with the uh, FBI, with the police department, with the CIA, and several other agencies. He wanted those agencies annihilated. He wanted them to be done with, over with. He wanted to control the intelligence uh, information directly from the White House under his control, not under all these different agencies. He felt that the intelligence was a detriment, not only to him, but to the survival of the White House and to the survival of the people in this nation. And uh, he felt a very serious threat by by the... Uh, all these different agencies who had um, uh, who had intelligence going on. Uh, this was called the Houston Plan, and the Houston Plan was being developed by a man named Tom Houston. If you Google him, you'll find out he was, who he was, and that organization was supposed to have been done away with years ago, shortly after, uh, or during the time of Watergate, or shortly afterwards, but it wasn't. It, it was put out there that that it was being done away with, but the operation was fully functional as it is today. And um, uh, the um, that was the only, by the way, the only program that I was working for where I was actually getting paid a salary. And uh, if you consider a hundred dollars a week salary, that's what I was getting, plus a fifty dollar plus. Uh, expense account. Uh, and these were uh, such great expenses that maybe a ride in a cab that cost five dollars, or um, or how about a dime uh, to put in the payphone? Because I didn't have a phone at home. I had to use payphones. They preferred it that way because they didn't want anybody tapping my telephones. Um, but uh, I actually had to keep keep a log of nickels and dimes just to justify. Uh, a very small expense account, and I was very honest. All the other agencies in Washington, D.C., other than that, and including in New York, when I worked for them, I never received any money. They offered it to me. I refused it. Um, and I'll get to that later on, but that was all completely fraud. It was 
collusion. It was uh, uh, it was a scam and a total corruption by the police department here in New York, and including the, the police departments even in Washington D.C. during the time. To uh, to but, get back uh, to Washington for a moment, um, you you confided in us yesterday that you had uh, three meetings with uh, President Nixon, and I'm wondering if you could just, if not divulging the content, can you tell us the circumstances around surrounding your, why you were ushered into the president's uh, office or met with him? I, I really can't. Are you, hello? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I really can't and I won't because I made promises to the president, even though the president is dead. Yeah. I still feel honored and obligated to keep that promise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, are, are you there? Oh yes, I'm here. I'm listening. Uh, okay, it's not no. like we were cut no. off, sir. No, I, I just uh, I like to uh, I like to. I'm only going to simply say that the president trusted me. Okay. Why he trusted me was something that I questioned myself. I mean, after all, I consider myself a uh, hillbilly from West Virginia with uh, not even a high school diploma. You know, uh, he had heard of me, I guess, through through different sources of his, uh, which he would have at his fingertips, but. Uh, um, it, it, he, he trusted me. That's all I could say. I mean, he had okay. every, every means at his fingertips from the, from the military to every police mm -hmm. enforcement agency in the mm -hmm. world. But, but, uh, he trusted me and I consider it to be an honor mm -hmm. even to this day. And, uh, did you share any of the details that you've given us about the Watergate break-in with him? Did you tell him how it went down? No, I did not. Okay. All right. Let's continue with uh, with the next uh, stage of of your account of the war of Watergate exposed. I must say that was a tremendous irony. I don't know if the audience noted it, but when Rita was walking with you past the creek, and she saw that a gate had been thrown into the water, and like, I don't think people got the synchronicity of that, the sign, the psychic uh, element for her. As I understand it from her comment, look. I look, I agree with you. I mean, there's quite look, an there's irony. A gate, if that was there's the case. a gate in the water. That that was remarkable. That's remarkable. Yes. yes so please continue, Mister. Okay. Mr. After uh, after Watergate was uh, over with, or not, I shouldn't say over with. It never became over with. Not even to this day. But um, uh, Carl told me, and in fact, it was on my birthday, which was June the twenty second, just a few days after his that we had to split up, that I could no longer live at that apartment anymore, that he would have to relocate me, and that I was forbidden to talk to anybody in the media, and um, I had to go extremely low profile, in other words, to get lost. Um, he got me a job working for a man named Buster Riggin, who was a low mafia profile type from New York, uh, worked with a man named Joe Neslin. Uh Joe Neslin was the closest thing to the mafia in uh, Washington, D.C., he was uh, uh, Marine Dean, who is uh, John Dean's uh, wife. She and her girlfriend, and I mean girlfriend literally, um, they both worked for uh, Neslan. They were prostitutes, they were lesbians, they were lovers. Um, they, uh, they, uh, John Dean, um, was not exactly honest. The things that I learned, and I cannot say who the source was, but I can simply say that John Ding, even though he was a presidential White House aide and close to the president, along with General Haig, both of these people had did have to do with uh, wanting to get rid of the presidency. They had been promised to positions that if the president had left, that that uh, somebody would be getting the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of uh, whatever. They were all promised uh, these jobs. John Dean uh, said that he was the first one to testify at the Watergate General Select Committee hearings, but he wasn't. I was. And I did so in executive, uh, executive sessions. I was subpoenaed by Senator Sam Irving from North Carolina, who had a big, long, black stretch limo to pull up at my job outside of Buster Riggins' uh, adult bookstore in Washington, D.C., and served me with a subpoena. 
And uh, then they picked, had me picked up in a car the following day. When I got out of the car, uh, there was a man who walked over to me by the name of Wayne Bishop. And um, I think Wayne's his person, I'm not sure. It's Wayne Bishop. Anyway, he came over, he put his fingers on the back of my neck, and he pinched the muscles on the back of my neck very uh, very harsh, and he he actually hurt me. In fact, I made a little made a little whelp about my the way I did. But he said, "Listen, you go in here, and he said you're going to testify. He said uh, in executive session, he says, and that means you keep your effing mouth shut. He says about uh, uh, about uh, exactly what you did and who for and." Uh, he said, you don't say anything about it, any homosexual crap. He said, they don't want to hear that stuff. And uh, he said, if you don't do it, he said, you don't follow my words. He said, you won't see, you will not see the sun come up in the morning. And uh, so at that point, I walked into the committee. They asked me, uh, they, uh, in fact, they, they asked for the stenographers to leave the room. And there was two or three of them, and they were all asked to leave. May I, ask you, was, may I ask you what what agency you think this man, did he identify himself as, as an agent, a particular agency, or just came out of uh, the he worked He worked on Capitol Hill. He was one of their investigators. Oh, okay. Right. But um, anyways, um, uh, I followed his instructions, and then when it, uh, the room was dark, and it was almost like an interrogation room, the lights were in my face, and there, was, there were cameras going to, and... There was no media there, um, uh, but I felt t so totally uncomfortable that I just simply stated that um, um, I've been restricted from talking about certain things and just so under threat of my life, and therefore I don't feel comfortable in, in uh, resuming this conversation. And I got up and I walked out. And, uh, there were a couple of attempts made by Senator Sam Irving and Barbara Jordan from Texas, another senator, that tried to get me to come back, and I wouldn't do it. But after that, I testified before the the Church Committee, the Pike Committee, and the Senate Select Committee, the uh, Archibald Cox's Saturday Night Massacre uh, uh, hearings, and the the list went on, and the doors started to open. And May I ask you about the church committee? What was the nature of your testimony before the church committee? I didn't have a chance to really say because before I, all of these these committees was like a farce. I mean, they would ask me questions before I could even answer, and I was told, "Well, let's go on to the next subject." And right. The next subject never never right. came around. Deflection and just, uh, misdirection. Yes. Uh, if yeah, you, uh, if anybody wants to get a good idea of what if Mr. Merritt is talking about, just open up any. Interrogatory uh, that you find in the Warren Commission report. Any time the testimony is going in the right direction, they instantly deflect it or, or distract you. So that's a, a typical uh, tactic in in those proceedings. Well, there's 70 or 80 some books on the hearings, and my name is in there in a little small paragraph. And all it says is that that um, Robert Merritt uh, worked for the FBI with. Uh, uh, intelligence, and uh, he is a known homosexual, and that was it. I see. That, that was the whole thing about me. Right. And now that book is missing from the Senate Select Committee. You can't mm -hmm. find it. It's gone. I'm talking about today. It's gone. But anyways, um, my attorney at the time was David Isbell, a Covington and Birthing Law Firm, and... Uh, uh, Mr. Isbell was that firm was quite powerful, and they the government was afraid of that agency. I mean that that firm, and uh, it was Mr. Isbell himself became a little leery as to just how far the government was going to go. He was very concerned about my safety and my welfare, and there were attempts made on my life. I mean, I had people who. Stopped their car at three o'clock in the morning. I would be out going to an all-night restaurant as I usually did, and one car stopped in the middle of the intersection, and someone got out of the car across the street, and they aimed a gun right at me, and they shot over top of my head. Yeah. I had a house on another occasion, and they came in there very cleverly through the back basement door, and they took rags of bricks and other degree crumbled up bricks, and they stuffed up the gas flue to my hot water tank, and it was pouring carbon monoxide. 
out into my bedroom, which the flu went through my my fireplace in my my bedroom, and uh, I was getting sick by the day, and someone noticed it, and they said something is wrong. Says you know there's something smells funny in here, and you're not looking well. You're turning very pale, and when we and checked it out and called the gas company. The the gas man did pull out the flu, and he emptied out all these rags and rocks and bricks that stopped up the the uh, flu. Mr. But, uh, Mr. Merritt, we have about 20 minutes left in this interview. Perhaps we should move on to uh, your experiences in New York and the Kenmore and the other part of uh, the story that you wanted to uh, share. It's very important with the audience, including, um, if we can get to it, to adult uh, adult protection services, things like that. So yeah, would you... Oh, would oh you, yes, yes. Oh, right. Yes, uh, in New York City... Um, when I first came here, Carl had sent me here. Uh, I had been indicted on 23 counts of uh, fraud, and uh, this was a phony uh, indictment. It was a phony case. Uh, all 23 counts read the same, that uh, Robert May committed uh, a fraud on such, such a date, and that was it. Did not explain anything that I did in all 23. I was told to select three or four of those cases, um, you know, to uh, to take a plea to go to prison, spend three and a half years. Uh, I did that, but they were all read the same, so I just I said, well, just take three, five, and seven, whatever, just pick any number you want. And and uh, the judge was a judge, Reggie Walton, the same famous Reggie Walton that had been involved in so many big cases in the uh, D.C. with with many 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 presidents and other big people. But um, anyways, uh, Carl gave me money, and so did Mary and Barry. They both put me on a plane, not together, and uh, told me to never come back. And Mary and Barry had, was wanted to get rid of me because I knew about his cocaine activities. I knew about him having uh, Lenny Bass uh, killed. This was a basketball player from, uh, I think, was going to Connecticut or somewhere to, he just signed a contract for several million dollars and uh, he was at a party in um, Maryland, and the, the mayor was there, and quite a few other people were there. Well, Lenny was given a very strong potency of uh, uh, cocaine, and he he died that night from the from that overdose. Wow. Um, but uh, there was so many things that I knew, uh, just so many, many much stuff that wasn't funny. I was put into a prison, 557 uh, inmates. 556 were black. I was the only white, if you can consider me white. But if you see me and you take a picture of me in the book or even go on the Internet, my hair is blonde. I have green eyes. My skin is white. And uh, uh, unfortunately, my father's picture is not there. But if you could see him, see my mother, if you, see, you would know that that is my father. Um, but the fact that Pentagon... To, Thank me for my father who sent me actually the Purple Hearts and all the other medals from the White House. Uh, this was done as a means to keep me shut up. Anyways, they sent me into New York City, Carl did, and uh, shortly after I got here, uh, I was robbed, and I think that robbery was was a set-up thing because uh, I was left penniless. I couldn't get in touch with Carl's software. I literally became homeless on the streets. I lived in in um, um, Mole City under Grand Central Station for uh, for almost a year. And this was an area several floors underground on a defunct uh, subway track, uh, train track. And um, uh, there I stayed for, for one whole year. It was a very well sa safe place. Everybody went in down there was was searched by guards as you go in for drugs, for weapons, for whatever. Uh, there was just no nonsense. Some of the people actually uh, lived down there, worked on Wall Street. They said, I asked them, I said, why are you doing here? You work on Wall Street? It's because we got we got to save enough money to get us an apartment to live the lifestyle that they, our employers want us to live. And they were being very serious. But uh, anyways, I did move on from that to uh, the Kimmore Hotel. The Kimmore Hotel was a drug-infested place. Uh, and for a number of years, I infiltrated that, uh, and then in 1995, I think it was, um, the uh, uh, I had been contacted by several uh, agents and people here in New York 
And uh, they too had profiled me, and they wanted me to infiltrate the people at the Kimmore, which consisted of murderers, rapists, major drug dealers, and etc. Carl was out of the picture because he had passed away from uh, some strange illness that I think that the CIA concocted uh, for him. I, it was a rare, very rare, rare blood disease. He died at John Hopkins University Hospital in Maryland. Um, by the way, he was doing the infiltration of the Kimmore Hotel, which was on 23rd and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan. Uh, it was a 959-bed uh, hotel, and the place was the, the pit of hell. And, you know, during that time I had purchased or set up, or both, uh, drugs and guns from 229 residents at the hotel. There was 959 rooms, and all those other rooms were occupied. It was on a, a, a early morning that um, I had just gotten out of bed. I was told that the drug raid was going to go off like the, uh, in a couple of days. Well, I got up out of bed that morning. I slept late, and I was sitting with my back to the window. It was a very hot day. Uh, I just turned on the TV. I was watching. There was uh, I had a bunch of bananas sitting beside me, so I started eating the bananas. And just to be on the nasty side and be a typical person from the Kimmore, I would eat a banana and throw the peel out the window. I was about uh, seven stories up, and bang, bang, bang on the door, and these cops say, uh, sir, sir, are, are you uh, throwing bananas? Appeals out to one. I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, are you? I said, yes, I'm sure. I said, you want to search my room for bananas? And they went away and left me alone. I said, my God, they grazed my pillow to find my bananas. But I looked out the window. I said, how the hell did they get up here that quick? I looked out the window, and here was all these white shirts down there, captains, lieutenants, and they just stand there with banana peels on top of their heads. I thought, oh, my God. And the street had over a 1,000 agents that day, from the police to the FBI to drug enforcement. To everybody was out there. And anyways, they got me out of the hotel, and um, the raid went off successfully. It was the largest drug raid ever in the United States. And um, um, like 229 people were arrested. And a lot of them never came back. A lot of them simply disappeared off the face of the earth like Rita Reed. Um, after that, I moved around from borough to borough doing different narcotics jobs for uh, different people. Um, different, when I say people, I'm talking about police narcotics. Um, I, hello? Uh, I'm here. Hello? Okay. I'm here. Don't worry. I had, I had uh, moved... Um, from Brooklyn up to the Bronx, and I moved into a real ghetto area, and that's where the drug and fasted rats was, but I didn't know that much of the rats were cops, not drug dealers. And, you know, and getting well acquainted with a lot of drug dealers the way I did, you know, there's so many young black and Hispanic men and women who told me, you know, if the government would only give us a job, so we wouldn't want to be out here. So you don't go over to Central Park West and see uh, see, you know, uh, white boys uh, uh, out there selling drugs on the corner. I said, you know, it only affects us that the, the white boys go to jail and we go to jail. They go to jail and we go to jail. And it was about the size of it. But, um, anyways. Uh, oh, hello? mister, I, I, I'm here. I, I have a question. I want to uh, backtrack a little bit. We, we skipped something sure. very important. Yes. You, you told me yesterday on the show that during the anti-war period, you were assigned by a government agency to distribute taffy to demonstrators. Yes. Please tell the yes. audience about that. Well, I was involved in so many dirty crook stuff, from, from you know breaking into places to forgeries of documents to... And, I mean, the list goes on. If I ever had to be indicted on all the counts and things that I've done in my life while working for the government, I'd, uh, it'd probably, it'd probably exceed over 20,000 years or something. But, and I'm not really not exaggerating. But anyways, um, the FBI gave Carl Schaffler 200 pieces of white, uh, white seawater uh, taffy and little wrappers of taffy and... Uh, Carl told me to take these to the anti-war demonstration and pass them out. Don't ask any questions, just pass them out. And I did. And so uh, shortly after that, people started dying. And there was uh, over 100 people that died. 
about 80 people who went completely insane and never made it out of the institution. Another 20 or so people did actually make it out, but never recovered completely well. So this was done as an attempt to stop the anti-war movement, and I was told the reason. I, I sort of... Uh, I sort of, I mean, I objected to what I was doing, and I was told, listen, you're a soldier in the war, you have to do things, you have to carry out orders, and you don't ever question, you know, what we tell you to do, we are the government, and you don't question what the president asked you to do, as if the president asked me, you did. And uh, I said, well, you have to carry out the orders. Well, I did, and like I said, all those people died. It was in the newspaper a day or so after that, talking about, there was a bunch of hippies in DuPont Circle area who... I was experimenting around with uh, drugs, and uh, they died from overdoses of LSD and other things they put in the paper, and, and that was it. It was almost about maybe three paragraphs long on page 1000A or something. Did you ever uh, learn what was really in the taffy? Yes, it was LSD. It was LSD, but it was, uh, it was at very high doses, very high. Okay. And... Well, you know, I would remind the audience that uh, in those days, the Nixon era, prior to Richard Nixon's uh, administration, it was not against the law for people to take LSD or mescaline or psychedelics or psychotropic uh, elements. As a matter of fact, it, it is a historical fact that President Kennedy uh, did two LSD trips in the White House with uh, Mary Meyer who was a CIA agent, and she had ferried the LSD to President Kennedy in 1962 directly from Timothy Leary. And you can get details of that in Timothy Leary's uh, autobiography called Flashback. I, I never told you this before, and I, I don't mean to sound selfish, but again, I'm looking at eight minutes left. Yes. But I want to I wanna put this in there, too. One of my assignments was to kill John Lennon, and that was before he was actually killed. I was actually given the weapon to kill him and, um, the night before it actually happened. I don't want to go into any more details now because uh, John Lennon's history, we know the story about that. Yes. And I don't mean to jump over somebody as famous as John Lennon and all the people who admired him and who loved him, but I'm afraid I'm not one of those people because uh, uh, to me, John Lennon was somebody who was introducing uh, dr the drug culture into this country, and I held him very responsible for for a lot of the drugs that was killing our young people in this country. And I, well, at I'm least sorry. you can, at least you can have the good conscience that you did say no to the assignment. Yes. Yeah. But I want to get to um, to the Bronx. Yes, please do. Uh, I was um, uh, assaulted on July the 31st of this year by a young man who lives a block, half a block from me, by the name of Anthony Sanchez. And he's 25 years old. I'm 73. I walk with two canes, and I wear an oxygen tank when I go out. Um, I'm, I'm very independent. I can live alone. I can take care of myself, as I've been doing for 73 years. I don't need anyone's help. I can pay my own bills. I can bathe. I can take care of myself. I can cook my own meals. But uh, uh, the thing is, is somebody... And you said a magic word yesterday. I said that maybe the detective, who is Detective McGivney from the 52 Precinct in the Bronx, um, had, I thought he had maybe legitimate reasons for uh, not being able to make an arrest in that case because it, it is like shooting a goldfish in, in a, a bowl with a, uh, a missile. I mean, he's it's, it's just that close. But... Um, the thing is, is, I said that maybe he's uh, uh, underpaid, and uh, I said maybe he's got too many assignments, and then I paused and you said, or maybe he's restrained. You know, I, I do believe that you hit the magic word. I didn't want to say it because I have the utmost respect for uh, Detective McGivney, and I have the utmost respect for everybody in that precinct. Uh, especially the detectives and the uniform cops. I mean, some of them are some of the most devoted people that you ever want to meet in your life. I made a comment yesterday, and I'm going to repeat it because it was taken out of context, and that was uh, I was accused of saying that I would like to end my life by suicide by cop, 
that's not what I said at all. This was said some time ago by a police officer who was trying to discredit me for whatever reasons. But what I said was, if I was confronted on the street along beside a police officer, even a police officer I did not like, uh, who was my enemy or an FBI agent or, most of all, a private citizen, that if we ran encountered a person who had a gun with one bullet, I would step in front of that one bullet and take the bullet and be killed to save that cop, to save that citizen. That's the kind of person I am. I never, ever said that, that uh, I wanted to do suicide by a cop. To me, that is ludicrous. It's insane. And mm -hmm. I think it's a horrible way to try to discredit me. Who, but, started, that you know, who started that rumor? Because it uh, wasn't aired around here. But uh, I guess uh, it's part of this harassment uh, that's typical. By the way, Mr. Mr. Merritt, uh, yes. if you feel that this is a group that's doing this to you, it is a crime and it has a name. Most people don't know it, but it's called uh, gang stalking, predatory gang stalking. When any group or a, a two or more people get involved in targeting an individual to harass them, to menace them, to put stumbling blocks in their way to make them fail at work. Uh, this, this was actually uh, codified and defined in the FBI offices, in the Chicago FBI offices, where certain FBI men, Caucasians, had targeted an African-American FBI agent. And they went about methodically making his life miserable with the intention of making him resign which they did, but he had enough information later on to uh, bring a suit against the, these FBI agents, and uh, that's where the, the crime was defined. It had been, this has been happening since time immemorial, but it was only then that the crime was defined and given a name. You, you Predi predatory predatory yeah. gang stalking. As you a person who's I'm not, a, I'm not an agent, I'm not a cop, so those things don't really apply to me. And in the eyes of the police, I'm only considered to be as, as an informant, and that's it. No, Mr. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Merritt, this yes. term applies to any individual in the United States, it, a citizen, who it, is targeted by anybody. It doesn't mean police organizations. It means okay. anybody, corporate, uh, corporate life, uh, small business, local gangs, local gangs targeting an individual who lives in the neighborhood. Uh, and in a group think uh, menacing them okay. that is called predatory gang stalking. So you have recourse uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Morningstar. I'm, I'm engaging at the clock and it's I got three minutes left. Yes, go ahead. Go right ahead please. It's scaring me uh, You know, uh, I really wanted to get this out because listen my life is is at jeopardy only by certain people I have no problem, you know, I recently filed internal affairs complaints against uh, certain things that was going on in the police department. One of them was, was downgrading my criminal case, which was, uh, I say my criminal I'm talking about the person who assaulted me. That case was written up perfectly by an officer de Leon as an assault. And then when it got to the papering sergeant that made its way upstairs to the detectives, it was written up as harassment. Harassment cases are never investigated, they're never arrestable. They go into a foul drawer to collect dust, and that was it. Uh, uh, assault number two holds two years minimum to whatever the time the judge wants to put on the case. I, like I said, I have the most utmost respect for police officers, and somebody has been bad mouthing me and putting things out there that that should not be. And I was even told just the other night about a person who said he was arrested for shoplifting, and he said that outside of the cell in the processing area where they take the uh, photos and the prints. He said that my picture had been had been enlarged from a mugshot to a, a full-blown picture, eight and a half by 11, and put on the wall. At the very beginning of all these mugshots, he said he told the officer, he said, I know this person, why is this picture of her like that for? Because uh, I stand out. I mean, I'm an older man. And uh, he also says he likes to F with us, and so we're effing back with him. I don't know what he means with that because I don't go out of my way. Uh, you know, somebody is putting out some very vicious, uh, nefarious rumors against me to make the police think that I'm out to get them. And I'm not. I'm not. I was very sincere when I said that I would take a bullet for a citizen or for an officer. And I meant exactly every word of that. 
if it's something illegal, I'm making the remark, then God has helped me, please tell me, because I'm in every word. And if it is illegal to jump in front of a gun to save the life of a cop or a citizen, well, then I guess they'll just have to lock me up after I get killed. But, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Merritt, uh, we've come yes. to the end of the program. I thank you yes. very much for sharing your life with us, and especially these uh, revelations, uh, the inside scoop of how the Watergate uh, caper came down and all of the nefarious activities, actually, of government uh, against the citizenry and the targeting of individuals for political reasons. I think you've done the nation a service by exposing what was going on during the Nixon administration and in the aftermath, particularly in the uh, targeting anti-war demonstrators. This is, uh, so thank you very much once again, and I, I hope that we can have another conversation at another time. This is Robert Morningstar and Revolution Radio and signing off. Thank you for joining us for this issue of the Morningstar Report. Have a good night.